And like I said, we had no money. But one day, you know, we bought a, a forklift and the forklift had a piece of hard rubber missing. So every time the tire would turn, you go, katun, katun, katun. Our work was called a Fred Flintstone. But uh, we didn't care because, you know, you'd help us do our work. Welcome to Richard Haw's new YouTube channel. What would our kupuna do? If you are new to these ideas, kupuna is a Hawaiian word that means elders or ancestors. My name is Leslie Lang, and I will help host these discussions, which will come out once a week. What would our kupuna do is also the title of Richard's book published earlier this year, which is available from Amazon. There's also a free audio version of the book available, and you can find the link for that in the description box below this video if if you'd like to have a listen. The book discusses how growing up in a Hawaiian family shaped Richard's thinking, the impact that rising energy costs are having on everything and everyone and how we are living, and specific areas we can be focusing on right now to protect the future of our ohana, our families, and our island home. Richard, to start, will you introduce yourself? Tell us where you come from. I'm the great, great, great grandson of Kamahili Nui from Lower Puna. He had 12 male children and one female. So there's a lot of Kamahilis um, in that area. He signed a Kuei petition, with, which is a petition protesting annexation. My Kamahili side was Frank Kamahili down the beach at Maku'u is where our line Kamahilis lived. And um, Tutu Lady Meleana Kamoi Kamahili was his wife, but he was, she was no question the matriarch of the family. How I was influenced by uh, the Kamahili family was, first of all, through Tutu Lady. We went down to Maku'u in the 50s, and uh, she didn't know we were coming because there was no communication back then. So we just one day we just showed up, and she we had never seen her before. And we, we, we went down, we were five or six kids, I forget exactly. She, she welcomed us like I, I've never been welcomed before in my life. She, she didn't speak English. We didn't speak Hawaiian, but she just took us, you know, and you, as kids. I never forgot it. You know, I was so impressed with that. And then later on, as time went on, her son, Ulrich, we call him Uncle Sonny, he went and joined the Merchant Marine, so he got to see the world. But then he came right back to Maku, where it was a sustainability type of lifestyle, yeah? Go down the beach and, and whatever you catch and whatever you grow, that, that's all they needed. So he went to the Merchant Marines, he came back and right back to subsistence, subsistence farming. I learned a lot from Uncle Sonny. Uh, he had a really strong personality. And when I first started going back to Maku again, it was mainly because we were planning to grow bananas. And he had some banana kiki. So I would go down there and talk to him. Not so much talk to him. I went down there to listen because he did all the talking. But after many times and many hours of listening, I, I, I got two major things of value from, and, and it came from the land. Basically it was, if the farmer makes money, the farmer will farm. And number two, if the pluses exceed the minuses, then it's sustainable. If the pluses don't exceed the minuses, it's not sustainable. And and in the early days, I, I picked up, you know, those values and I, I wanted to share those kinds of values with younger next generations. But it was pretty obvious to me that I had to go figure out what to do with myself first before I could start talking or doing anything. You were a successful Big Island farmer for almost 40 years. Tell us about that. Tell us what you grew and where you grew it and how that all evolved. Yeah, so what happened was uh, I grew up as a Kolohi kid, you know, and none of our family went to college. I, I just got my values from what was passed on from my, from my dad. You know? So I went to church college, spent a little bit of time there transferred to University of Hawaii, didn't take too long, I flunked out of school. And at that time, if you flunked out of school, you got drafted to go to Vietnam. The values that my pops sent down to us was not no can't can and find two answers for every problem and one more just in case. So given that situation, I figured, okay, let's let's figure out what, what, what can I do to make the best of this situation? So I thought, you know what, I'll, I'll just answer the questions that they ask you, you know, because you have to fill out these sheets of paper. And, and my answer was all set up so when the person read that, it would kind of lead that person to think this might be an office of material. One day when I was at Fort Ord, California, uh, basic training, they sent us uh, to tour the officers club. What I did notice was that the officers had rolled toilet paper and us <laughs> draftees, we had square toilet paper. I said, you know, I got to be an officer. <laughs> Make the best of the situation is what I'm trying to get across here. So that's that's how it started for me to become an officer. And then tell me about your um, your farming background. So I went to Vietnam. I came back, and we had this uh, value that I picked up 
from the military. And that is, you can have all kinds of discussions about whatever, whatever, but when it got down to cases, you were in a battle. You know, it was all of us against whoever else was out there. And so the unwritten rule was that we all come back when nobody comes back. And that was really influential on my life because I like that idea of, of working together with people. So when I came back, I, I started looking around trying to figure out what I would do. And so there was an opportunity to grow bananas because Chiquita was sending bananas into Hawaii and we grew bananas before. So we know how to grow bananas on a small scale. So I decided to start doing that. I, went, I finished up and got my degree and I majored in accounting for the simple reason reason that I wanted to be able to uh, keep score. So when I came back, I ran this uh, poultry co-op. So I got a little bit of experience there. And like I said, uh, Chiquita was, you know, starting to send bananas into Hawaii. And I, and I thought, gee, we can do that. But we didn't have any money. So what I would do is collect all the banana boxes in, in the stores. Every time I'd go down you know, with the poultry co-op, you know, visit. We started growing bananas at Waikiuka. And because I had taken this uh, accounting course, I knew that we needed to have a certain amount of volume. So we had expanded to Kauai down in Puna, for Four Corners down here in Puna. And it was 60 acres there. So we, we started planting bananas there. From there, we needed more volume. So we moved into uh, Keaau. And there, we uh, increased our farm to 300 acres. And uh, we produced, uh, you know, a lot more bananas. But then there was a bunch of top virus that came in. So we needed to diversify. So we looked all over the place. And one of the primary things was that bananas need two and a half million gallons of water annually. And so we looked everywhere and we realized that up at the Pipikil place where their sugar cane was shutting down, it, there was that much water just fell out of the sky and it was free. So we moved up there and that was 600 acres. So we got to 600 acres. I think you retired in 2016. And then that gave you time to really focus on this, which has been so important to you and that you'd already been working on for a long time, making life better here on this island for future generations. Tell us the big picture story about why that's important to you. Well, you know, right, right around there to 16 to uh, 2017, I went to the first peak oil conference and there I realized that uh, the world had been using twice as much oil as it had been finding and had been doing it for 20 years already. It, it didn't take a genius to figure out that if this kept on happening, sooner or later, the prices would start to rise on oil. So from there, I started to study as much as I could about the subject. All of the fighting that's going on in the world has to do with energy. Everybody's positioning themselves about energy. You have said that you started noticing all the costs rising in terms of the what you were doing on the farm, right? Yeah. You know, our cost of production started going up. When I started to look at it, I realized it was all related to byproduct of oil, you know, like for the boxes, the plastics, the fertilizer, everything that's made out of oil, uh, byproduct of oil was rising. When I realized that, I said, oh boy, okay, now what can we do? So we started to position ourselves to address that. There was lot, lots of competition and it became tougher and tougher. So we shut the farm down and then we uh, leased it for, you know, the farmers are, are farming on the land. Now we're in a position to be able to say, okay, Let's take a portion of our land and use it to make life better for future generations. In other words, what can we do to help us with food security? Because when I said energy was the most important thing, the primary source of energy is food. Without food, you can't do anything. So that's what was the start of our, our modern day ahupua'a. We're trying to figure out what is it that we can do to make life better for future generations. We have two springs and it's relatively stable. You know, I've, I've been there for, I don't know, 30 years or so. And uh, I've never seen the water drop. It kept on oh. flowing. No matter what, you know, we all know that more of our, our youngsters are leaving and that's because we don't have options for them. But there are ways that we can do things to utilize the, the modern technology to keep our youngsters here. And going back to your book for a moment, what would our kupuna do? Tell us about that title. What does that mean to you? You know, I attended the Kikuhi Kanaka Ole's Halau. What is interesting about it was she, she talked about past generations and how they looked at things. The Hawaiians didn't have medals 
back then. So there was no money. So in order to trade, you'd have to give more than you receive. And then later you get, you expect back. It's called reciprocity. The more you give, the more you receive. They took it a step further than that. And they, they looked at, you know, all living things as living brethren, divine brethren. Humans are not any more important than any other living things. That's why there's the tree people, the fish people, bird people. What they did was they balanced their needs against their resources that way. And once I understood that, I said, holy smokes, you know what? It's, it's not very complicated. It's pretty much common sense. That's why I'm on the path that I am right now. And I know a tagline from the book reads that we too are someone's ancestors and we need to make wise decisions now to take care of future generations and meet our people's long-term goals. And that kind of says it all, I think. I imagine a situation where future generations will look back at us and ask themselves, what information did they have? What could they have done? We have to do the right thing because we're their ancestors and there is nothing more important than that. Right. Thanks for listening to our new YouTube vlog, What Would Our Ku Puna Do? We'll be posting weekly about what Richard's working on to help make a more sustainable lifestyle here on Hawaii Island. So stay tuned.